All right, greetings. Welcome to Sunday, September the 13th, uh, 2020. Uh, Eric Hossel with you uh, again for Bella Vista Baptist Church and the Joint Heirs Bible Study. So welcome. Uh, today we are in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, which represents the entire uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6. Um, and you could loosely term it, uh, as the title of our lesson is, God Sends. Um, a little long a little longer uh, version of that description might be God calls his people to recognize and declare his sovereign purpose. So last week, Pastor Dave Brown gave us a thorough and enlightening introduction to the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah being the greatest of the writing prophets whose work reaches back to the eternal counsels of God and the creation of the universe, looks forward to the new heavens and the new earth, and all the nations of the earth fall within the scope of Isaiah's predictions, which foretold Christ's birth. Uh, we'll see that later in chapters 7 and 9, his deity. In uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, his ministry. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, 42, 1 through 7, and 61, 1 through 2. Jesus' death in chapters 52 and 53, and his future reign uh, that are replete through chapters 2, 11, all the way through 65, and more within the, within the book. Um, in no other place in the scripture written in the Old Testament under the law is there a better and finer view of grace um, that God has for us and is, uh, and is particularly on its way in the New Testament. So Isaiah stands quite alone um, in... Um, in his writings and in the breadth of his writings and what God revealed through him. So uh, quickly, let's, uh, let's pray and just uh, ask the Lord to clear us and the Holy Spirit to fill us and just connect with his word. Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we live in a country where we are free to worship you and to learn your word um, and to fill ourselves with your knowledge and your wisdom, God. We know that uh, as our Loving Father, that's what you want for us and desire for us as we move forward in this crazy world. We know that we are not given a spirit of fear, um, and we just love and thank you, God, and pray that you will pour down in us uh, your Holy Spirit. God, Holy Spirit, please fill us up, connect us with this word, and just scrub away and set aside every other thing that might, uh, that might distract us from you. In your Son, Jesus' precious name, Lord. Amen. All right, so um, just to clarify and prep a little bit, uh, in today's lesson, we're focusing on chapter 6. Um, Isaiah has in chapter 5 um, identified Israel as the Lord's vineyard. In chapter 5, he, he presents a song, um, and it relates the nation of Israel's position to the Lord. Um, verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. Yet in verses 8 through 26 of chapter 5, Isaiah lays out six woes uh, upon unfaithful Israel. A woe was an exclamation of God's judgment related to death, related to the grieving of death. And so a woe as it, as it was related to God and God's will um, it was an exclamation of his judgment in, in the fashion of mourning. Um, not in the fashion of fear or excitement, but, but particularly in mourning. So it was, uh, it was a very drastic and, and, um, and dark reaction to what would likely be uh, a very stern judgment, um, and deservedly so. Um, with sadness, Isaac puts forth these woes um, over those who fail to recognize um, the true misery of their condition. We should recognize these six woes today. One, woe unto those who join house to house and field to field. What he's saying here, um, Pastor Cope referred to this as avarice, which is extreme greed for wealth and rapaciousness, which it means that someone is aggressively greedy. It's aggressive greed. Um, and it's clear that this sin and this position, this behavior was was rife uh, within Israel and certainly um, within Judah um, around Isaiah. 
The second woe is woe to those who run after strong drink. This is the drunk you don't respect. This is the person who gives their life up to uh, gluttony or to addiction, whatever that may look like. It doesn't necessarily need to be drink. Uh, we know that addiction comes in many forms, uh, and that temptation can come in many forms. The third woe is woe to those who think in pride and profanity and falsehood, but specifically dare the Lord to show himself, who, who defy the Lord uh, in arrogance. Um, we know God hates pride above all else because it leads to all sin, and that was very specific um, in the third woe that Isaiah pronounced over the nation. Um, the fourth was woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Are we not firmly in the middle of that today? Paul had warned of that as well, and that's certainly where we are today with this relativistic view of your truth is your truth, and what is good is what we say is good, and then next week maybe it's different? Yeah, we are in that state. Woe to those who are wise in their own sight was the fifth woe, and that is that intellectual arrogance. I'm smarter than God. I don't need God. We don't have use for that. That is that brand of arrogance. And the sixth woe was, a, was, was laid out verbatim, laid out literally as a different kind of drinker. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine, uh, it, which would mean heroes to the world, who acquit the guilty for bribes, and who deprive the innocent of their right. And so these are those, uh, those people that uh, you might even know that are in positions of power, that take advantage of that power, who live and um, perform their, um, their lives and their duties in the world to the, um, to the point where you know, people hold them in high esteem and they do people wrong and they abuse their power. And it's just another form of that horrible pride that God hates. And that is the difference, and I think why that woe is separate from the second um, admonishing against drinking. This is not the drunk you don't respect. This is the, this is the person who's addicted to power um, and is a friend of the world and deprives the people around them um, of their rights or, or, um, or takes bribes. Um, so that kind of person. Those um, are the main types of people that, that, um, that were offending God in uh, particularly the kingdom of Judah, but Israel altogether. So as the Explore Guide puts it, the sins that brought on these woes were greed, social and economic oppression, carousing spiritual blindness, exploiting others, perversion of morality, and the arrogance of thinking that they were wiser than God. That If that doesn't um, pretty much describe the world right now as well, uh, then uh, I might be a little off the mark. I don't think I am. <laughs> so now God is laid out in chapter 5 and un through Isaiah, an unfruitful vineyard that he loves, and he would that it bears fruit. But his children, the nation of Israel, as Matthew Henry stated it, was this unfruitful vineyard representing the great favors God had bestowed upon them, their disappointing his expectations from them, and the ruin that they richly deserved. Chapter 5 concludes by outlining the punishments for his irreverent people, uh, again through Isaiah's song, which was almost poetic, and ends very darkly. Um, then we come to our lesson today, our focus, chapter 6. It begins with the date of 740 BC in the form of Isaiah saying, in the year that King uh, Uzziah died. This is the year of King Uzziah, um, also known as Azariah, his death. Um, he was the 10th king of Judah, um, which was the southern kingdom of Israel, uh, the tribe now well into its own identity as a kingdom. Uzziah had reigned for 52 years, from about 791 to 739. His reign marked the high water mark uh, for the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, he successfully warred against other nations. He extracted tribute from the Amorites. Uh, he expanded the kingdom militarily and otherwise, well into Philistia. Um, desert areas were reclaimed by water conservation methods that were utilized by the king. Um, and Jerusalem, Judah's seat of power, um, saw its walls reconstructed. The towers uh, were reconstructed. Defenses were added. So Uzziah, in 
relative terms, was a good king. But, as always, Uzziah became proud, and he attempted to take the role of the priests in the temple, which, ironically enough, was exactly the same form of pride and arrogance, an action that brought King Saul himself low. He tried to take the place of God's priests. God struck Uzziah with leprosy for his pride. You see, Uzziah had faked um, or sorry, had failed to tear down the high places um, from 2 Kings 15, 3 through 4 that his people continued to worship at instead of worshiping God. God hates idolatry. He hates pride. And after Uzziah was stricken with leprosy uh, and left his son to rule as he rotted and died, God is now sending his prophet Isaiah to announce his displeasure. We must note um, the similarities between the Hebrews of Judah here um, that we're reading about and learning about, the Hebrews of Jesus' time, whose necks were stiff and whose hearts were judiciously hardened, and humanity today. Our behavior, obedience, and commitment to the Lord our God must look like Isaiah's as we go through this and look, or we are the world. And we're going to see how that plays out. Verses 1 through 7 paint Isaiah's vision of God, while verses 8 through 13 define his commission from God. So let's go to the word. We are again in Isaiah chapter 6, and let's read it in its entirety. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train, or hem, of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two He covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having taken in hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Now we begin Isaiah's commission from the Lord. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people fat or dull, maybe in your Bible, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their heart, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains. When it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Now, some of this language may seem a little bit odd or curious um, or a little bit hard to understand, and in particular, God's commission may seem a little bit antithetical from a God who loves his people, saying, keep on hearing but do not understand. Make their hearts uh, dull and their eyes heavy, lest they see with their eyes. And we're going to dive into all of that. So, let's take a look at verse 1. Isaiah's vision began with a vision of the Lord and seeing the Lord, and he claims to have seen the Lord. But we see elsewhere in uh, Scripture that, that that's not the case, that no man has seen the Lord. So let's dive a little bit into that. We're not looking at a contradiction. Um, we're looking at something else. We're looking at a revelation. So um, in looking at 6 verse 1, uh, we also need to be reminded of Exodus thirty-three twenty. The Lord told Moses that no man could see his face and live. In John 1.18, this is confirmed, that no one has seen God. His eternal essence is invisible. We know this from 1 Timothy 1.17 and 6.16. 
He is spirit. We know this from John 4, 23 through 24. Yet Isaiah claimed to have seen the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up. The king, the Lord of hosts. There are other places in scripture where people see the Lord. For example, he revealed himself to Moses and the elders of Israel on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24 and to Ezekiel and John in glorious and mysterious visions in Ezekiel and Revelation. These theophanies, and that's what that, that's called, uh, the, an appearance of God as a theophany, um, these were typically accompanied by features drawn from the world of nature, such as storms or volcanic activity or smoke or fire, and often included the manifestation of God's glory, that that is what um, man is seeing and witnessing, an awesome weight or radiance that both revealed and hid his presence. They could be internal visions, for some of them, um, experiences of one person not shared by uh, bystanders such as this, um, or they could be literary visions, um, poetic expressions of the Lord's appearance um, composed in order to add force um, to the words of a spokesperson. In Isaiah's vision, it, this occurred in the temple uh, and was described in terms of the worship conducted there. The chanting of the seraphim, which are literally the burning ones, we'll touch base on that uh, momentarily, mirrored this the, the singing of the Levitical choirs um, uh, within the Old Testament. While the smoke of the altar filled the air, this suggests the vision of sacrificial ceremony um, that's in progress. Whatever the particular nature of Isaiah's vision, it was pivotal in his ministry. It, it, it lit his fire. And it created in him the proper reverence to the holy throne of God to empower him and allow him to go and be this greatest of prophets. In verse 2, we read, Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, with two they flew. Seraphim, which in the Hebrew is is Sarafim, um, means burning ones. Isaiah 6.2 and 6.6 are the only direct references to Seraphim um, in the canonized scripture. Um, the Hebrew word Saraf, right, is used seven times in the Bible. This is the singular of Seraphim, is Saraf. Um, in the singular Saraf, burning one, uh, means fiery being. In note, um, Numbers 21, it's used to describe the fiery serpents that led Moses to create, um, at God's behest, uh, the bronze serpent to save them. These fiery serpents were, were Saraf. Uh, in Isaiah 14 and Isaiah 30, um, in his oracle, to, uh, his oracle concerning Philistia, and then his oracle concerning Egypt, um, the term is utilized again in the singular, Saraf, which are of fiery serpents uh, or fiery beings uh, and the danger that they constitute. In the plural, sarafim, uh, means a burning noble. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the added picture of the danger and power of fire, but of nobility, uh, of intelligence, of, of um, meaning. And so in Isaiah 6.2 and 6.6, we see sarafim is what is used. Um, the Sarafim covered their eyes before the glory of the throne and covered their feet in reverence and submission. And these are great angelic beings created long before us. Not even they look directly upon the throne. So these are the Seraphim that are, uh, that are in accompaniment of the throne and in worship of God. Now in verse 3, one calls to another and says... Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Now in Hebrew, the superlative, which means the most extreme example of something, something that surpasses all others. Um, I am a fan of the, uh, uh, of the Saints, right, football team, and I like Drew Brees. And so for me, Drew Brees has a superlative football talent. So that's, how you, that's what the superlative is. And in language, the superlative is the most extreme example of whatever it is that you're trying to describe. In Hebrew, the way that you declare something to be superlative is to repeat it three times. We see it within Scripture a great deal, particularly when the Hebrew is used. So God here is declared holy 
which is divine and perfect. But God here is declared holy, holy, holy. He alone is above all. His glory fills the whole earth. He alone is to be worshipped, honored, and obeyed. He is holy, holy, holy. Now, as we move on to verse 4 and 5, God's unimaginable majesty and power shakes the very foundations of the temple where uh, Isaiah is. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, for I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now God's unimaginable majesty and power shakes this very foundation, right? Fills the palace with smoke. This is a common description that we see in accounts of God's presence or God's voice. Um, and it is proper. Um, to see that kind of majesty and power at the utterance of God, because you have to remember, and we must remember, that the word of God who is Jesus and the word that was spoken spoke the universe into existence. So for him to speak at all is clearly going to shake the foundations of creation. It created creation to begin with. When standing before the very holy throne of God, Isaiah was suddenly horribly aware of his own sin and unworthiness and that of his nation. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Remember, woe is, uh, is nearly a funeral proclamation, a proclamation of death. Woe is me, for I am ruined. It meant I'm going to die. I am not going to make it. I'm standing before the holy throne of God. Sin cannot exist in the presence of holy perfection, of holy God. Isaiah was human unclean, and very suddenly terribly aware of it. Then comes verse 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Figuratively and visually, Isaac was to be the prophet of God, the spokesman for God. And he was right. His lips were unclean. He was sinful. There is an important element to this, of the, the, this burning, testing, purifying coal being taken from the altar, being taken from the altar. This is a vision of Christ. This is a vision of atonement and mercy being granted to Isaac to prepare him to prepare him to speak on behalf of the Lord and speak the truth of the Lord to an unclean and irreverent people. We cannot tell the truth of the gospel in the stewardship of the Holy Spirit with an unclean heart. We know the heart feeds the mouth, just ask Paul. Now in verse 8, we begin God's glorious call. What we're seeing here is God's direct call to Isaiah. He says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. How different from the Isaiah of a few moments ago. Once the Holy Spirit is within us, once we are forgiven, once we accept Christ in faith, we have no longer a spirit of fear. We have this confidence this purified fire granted to us through God's forgiveness. Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? Who will the Lord God send as his messenger? Who will go forth with the truth of the word of God, the truth that is, uh, the truth of the Trinity and God's grace? Because you'll notice God goes immediately from the singular to the plural. And we see this replete through the Bible. Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? As always, from Genesis on, evidence that God is in relationship with himself. The, the concept of the Trinity comes from this constant, instant, at once, singular and plural identity of the Lord and how he reveals himself to us. So we see that here as is appropriate. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Spurgeon himself uh, um, said, the, the, the Prince of Pastors, Spurgeon said, 
that any time you see a, that someone saw God in the Old Testament or heard him speak was actually seeing a, a Christophany, an, an early uh, uh, appearance of Christ. And that may be true. That may be true. Now, how does Isaiah answer? Here I am, send me, exclamation point. Isaiah had experienced the merciful, unearned, cleansing grace of God. He had received the sanctifying uh, forgiveness of God, which pardoned him from the death sentence of sin. And so he was ready. He was ready to take up uh, the mantle that God had offered and, and, and go forth. And this is where things get tough. This is where the mission that God gave him and the mission that God can give us can be very difficult and sometimes confusing and disheartening. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. God's telling Isaiah to tell this to his children, to his people. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Stay blind. Make the heart of this people dull. The literal word is fat and their eyes heavy. Blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And we're going to go on just a little bit more about that. But I, I want to say specifically, as we look at this, we're also looking at the Jews in the first century as Jesus was here, was here who refused him, who refused him. Um, and we're looking at the world around us now that regardless of the fact that, that, that this book, that the Bible is the single most proven ancient work in humanity, in all of history, and all of the apologetic proofs and all of the uh, everything that we dig out of the ground, every proof that we have that this is true, the majority of humanity we know will reject him, will reject that truth. And for God to take a people and save them, these people who have free will and who are stiff-necked and who do know the difference between good and evil and choose evil abundantly, how is he then going to save them? How is he then going to attract them? How is he going to save his people? God is a gentleman. He's not going to force you to spend eternity with him. And he doesn't force anyone to do so. And so, he must allow us to run our course. He must allow Israel to fall to Egypt and then, and then bring them back. And he must allow Israel to fall, as they will, to Assyria, to Sennacherib, to the different... Um, to the different horrible things that have happened to the nation of Israel and the different terrible things that happen to people in our world today in the church age because we choose it. God doesn't arbitrarily say, this is a sin and I don't want you to do it. God points out those areas that lack his holiness in the universe and those behaviors that lack his love and he hates them because they hurt his children. That is the sin that God hates. That is is what sin is. And so that is what God is saying here. You continue to choose the sin. You continue to choose idolatry. You continue to choose the enemy over your father that loves you. And so you will. And I will keep a remnant. God always keeps a remnant. And he always allows us to go the direction we choose. Now he will usher us. He will prod us. He will, and now that we have the Holy Spirit, he will um, guide us. But we have to understand the concept of judicial hardening, where God allows our necks to be stiff and allows us to harden our hearts against him. If he didn't intervene in the ways that he does, we would fully destroy ourselves. So, in verses 9 and 10, God begins uh, his message. In verse 11, Isaiah replies to the Lord, how long, how long is this going to happen? And then God speaks through him and speaks to the rest of time and the rest of, the rest of redemptive history uh, as it is approaching. Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. The nation of Israel experienced exactly this in the coming centuries. And the Lord removes people far away, the diaspora. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, aren't they? And though a tenth remain in it, and this is God speaking to his remnant, 
it will be burned again, over and over, like a terebinth, which is like an oak, whose stump remains. And here's the trick. When it is felled, when this nation falls, and that stump remains, the holy seed is its stump. What remains? The promise of Christ. What tribe was Christ prophesied to and actually did come from? The tribe of Judah. And that is where Isaiah finds himself right now. Verses 11 through 13, we see, ultimately, as he had before and would again, God used the world, foreign pagan nations, to purify his people. Judah had no idea right now that they were about to be taken over and enslaved. He would then reunify his people, and as always, he would leave a remnant, a remainder of the faithful, to guide the new. Therefore, his promise would stand. Salvation would come through the lineage of Abraham, down through the tribe of Judah, and salvation did indeed come, praise the Lord. So, we have seen that God is holy and chooses to reveal his glory to people. All are in need of God's forgiveness of sin. God invites willing followers to deliver his message to others, and God's messengers are to be faithful throughout their lives regardless of the response. Regardless of the response of the people to which you share the gospel, you are to continue to share the gospel. Regardless of the effect of our mission on the people around us that we love and so desperately want to see come to the Lord, we must continue our mission. Their reaction is not up to us. Our mission and obeying God in our mission is up to us. As Charles Spurgeon said of this chapter and verse, what a ministry, dark with insufferable light, insufferable light so bright and so clear that men should half to willingly harden their hearts and shut their eyes if they will not understand and perceive it. Do not give up on your mission. Take up our great commission wherever you are. Stay in the word and make disciples. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, Next week, we will see Rick move us into the next lesson and look forward to seeing you then. God bless.